Okay. Können wir beginnen? Ja. Hi everyone. Ah, ich kann meine Maske runternehmen. So, hi everyone. Thanks for being here with us today, tonight. My name is Michaela Gebolsberger. I'm representing IG Architektur. I would like to welcome you in, in our rooms of IG Architektur today. We have uh, guests on site and we have uh, quite a lot of digital participants. Um, the digital participants can ask questions in our chat and we will answer them after, your, after the talk of uh, Shenya. Um, I would like to point out that this event will be recorded and it will be available on YouTube afterwards on our website. So. Uh, we meet today in times of crisis and war. Um, this war is taking place on, Uc uh, on European ground. We are here today in Vienna in IG Architektur and on um, neutral ground. And we will talk about architecture, uh, the built heritage in, in Kharkiv, and the danger in which this heritage is situated or located right now. Today we will hear the lecture of Shenya Gubkina. So Shenya is the short version of Evgenia. <laughs> uh, she will talk about Ukrainian heritage of left leftist urbanism under Russian threat. And um, the event is organized by IG Architektur and uh, claiming spaces of the Technical University of Vienna. Um, just briefly about our schedule today, uh, after a short introduction, um, we will hear the presentation of Shenya Gubkina, and um, it will take around 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and afterwards uh, the guests are invited to ask questions, also our digital guests, as I said, in the chat, uh, in the YouTube chat. Um, Afterwards, so the guests on site are invited um, after the talk for uh, informal exchange in our courtyard outside. Um, a few words about uh, Shenya Gubkina. She's an ar architect, historian, and curator of architecture and art projects. Um, she is from Kharkiv. She's born there and was living there, or is living there. Uh, she's a co-founder of several NGOs and projects, uh, among others, uh, Urban Form Center and Women's Avant-Garde Movement. She graduated in uh, Kharkiv National Academy in Urban Planning. Um, she published several books, and we will, you can also have a look at some of the books, a selection uh, on the table at the entrance. Um, and we will also hear a little bit more about her publications. Um, after the war started um, in Ukraine, she was forced to leave, leave Kharkiv and now temporarily moved uh, to Latvia, where she's based right now. And uh, uh, Shenya is visiting Vienna just very briefly, and we are happy that we have you tonight. Um, we first, or I first met Shenya in 2016 for a project I did about uh, architecture research project with uh, Transit, and Shenya gave us a tour uh, through Kharkiv, and we were amazed about the city. It was beautiful, this architecture, and it was very impressive. And Shenya really knew every corner of the city. <laughs> um, a lot has been destroyed already, unfortunately, and um, it's feared that worse will become. So we will hear today Shenya's ideas, impression, and assessments with us today. I will now give uh, the word to Inge Manka from uh, Claiming Spaces, and about, she will also talk about her connection to Kharkiv and to Shenya. Thank you, Michaela. Hello, also from my side. As Michaela said, I'm Inge Manka. I work as a senior scientist at the Institute of Art and Design at the TU Wien. Today I'm here as a representative of our feminist bottom-up collective Claiming Spaces at the Faculty of Architecture and Spatial Planning. In November 2019, Shenya Kupkina was a guest and speaker at our first Claiming Spaces conference. 
Just before our second conference at the 26th of March, about two weeks ago, at the Architekturzentrum Wien, Shenya contacted us and asked whether we could help organize today's event. For the conference itself, Shenya wrote us an open letter, which was read out there. I would like to quote briefly from this letter. Dear participants of the second Claiming Spaces conference, in 2019, it was a different time. In my other old reality, I was here in Vienna participating in the first Claiming Spaces conference. I gave a talk that my colleagues called a burnout speech and I called it the dead architects speech. Through my personal story, I revealed a multidimensional aspect of the phenomenon of inequality and toxicity of some positive attitudes produced by liberal feminism. What is my reality today? My reality is a vastly destroyed home city of Kharkiv. For many years, I have been a guide of hundreds and thousands of people, as we heard, into this city. Most of my research and activist architectural and restoration projects were related to this city. I wrote a book about this city and I sent it to my publisher a month before the war. Its historical center, its heart, with the largest number of heritage sites of all styles and all periods is located was ruined. Each fourth building has been destroyed. Heritage objects, including the Dashbrom from the UNESCO tentative list, are in danger." End of quote. Today she will tell us in more detail about this heritage in Kharkiv. Before this book on Kharkiv, she wrote and edited or co-edited several other books on the Ukrainian urbanist heritage. Um, and as Michaela mentioned, some of them are in the back and you can have a look at them. On my side, there exists a second connection with the architecture and urban heritage of Ukraine. Since 1995, the two schools of architecture of Levivska Polytechnic and Theovin are cooperating. I've been part of this cooperation since 2016 and have had the opportunity to organize small artistic workshops with students in Lviv, Kharkiv and Slavutic. The workshop in Kharkiv took place in the Traktor city, which you will hear more about from Shenya, I think. You can find a small booklet on this workshop on the book table, as well as another one on the workshop we did in Slavutic, the replacement city for Pribyat near Chernobyl. Zhenya's guide on this last ideal city of the Soviet Union, as she called it, was a big help for us. So I'm really sad that we have to meet again under these cruel circumstances. Thank you for coming, Zhenya, for finding the time and above all the energy to come to Vienna and give us this lecture. Oh, so that is my first event, public event, uh, since COVID started. Uh, so I'm very happy to see all of you. Uh, it's really a very specific experience, and it's really sad that we should talk about such a sad topic. Uh, thank, thank you very much for presentation uh, in such a warm words of me and uh, moreover thank, thank you for having me uh, to IGI Architecture and uh, Claiming Spaces. Uh, so I'm really an architect, I'm really a archive and uh, for me it was a question how to um, Yesterday, for example, I thought, how should I popularize or uh, share information about this event uh, during uh, uh, the whole very difficult situation in Ukraine when people are dying? And I even wrote a small post about that, uh, and I can read that. Kharkiv is under the threat of a new phase uh, of the war. Heritage is memory, memory of both difficult and contradictory uh, periods. It is hard to talk about heritage preservation while people are being killed. But heritage is not just bricks and walls. It's what is beyond. But what is there? There are people, people of yesterday, people of tomorrow, and people of today. Today are often as dead as alive. 
as they homes, as they cities, so ruined and so withstanding. So I think that is the question, how should we talk about heritage preservation and uh, even just in general, how should we talk about architecture when such a lot of people are dying? And when there are so many bigger, uh, more tragic and more difficult uh, events, situations happened. For me, that is the answer that we should talk about heritage in such a moment. But there is the question, how should we talk about that? And I'm uh, desperately searching for the answer, uh, for the tool, for the method. How should we think about heritage? How should we talk about heritage? How should we protect heritage during war? And then how should we act, actually? And I can say in different uh, consultations, in different events uh, concerning uh, the situation in heritage protection issues during war in Ukraine, uh, I can be maybe pessimistic uh, or even a bit cynical. I can say that no one world institution or herit heritage protection organization, even including UNESCO, can't protect heritage during war. Because you can do actually nothing in front of missiles, in front of bombs, in front of shelling. Uh, and that is a reality, if we talk about my words on claiming the space last conference, that is the reality that we should think about which, actually. Because uh, most of post-war uh, organizations that were developed after the Second World War actually designed the procedures, designed the uh, methods, tools, and so on for peaceful times. And that is a huge problem because they have no answers and no methods what to do during war. Of course, we can be very angry when they said us that they are deeply concerned and that is uh, all that they can do. But actually, they really can do nothing. And uh, in such situation, I, I think that intellectual society, architects, uh, art and historians uh, should somehow think about how to reflect and how to understand that reality and then what type of reflection should we give people. Because people asking me each day in Messenger and uh, all other networks uh, by call, uh, calls, how to think about that how to think about what actually happens, what actually happens with our cities. So today I decided to talk about exactly leftist heritage. Um, ah, yeah. Uh, why leftist heritage? I think uh, that was some misunderstanding uh, in the Soviet heritage issues and Soviet heritage uh, questions for many years. I think that, uh, by the way, for many years, for decades, I think I was uh, involved exactly in Soviet heritage issues and uh, in Soviet modernism issues. That's why I somehow know the situation from inside. Uh, that is quite trendy, I think, you know, that modernism, postmodernism, and uh, everything in between uh, was very trendy for many years. And uh, I think that it happened uh, in such a strange way that the Russian Federation somehow um, appropriate all the whole, that concept of Soviet heritage. It means when you talk about Soviet heritage, usually you, uh, you think about Moscow heritage or Russian heritage. Uh, I think that um, we should somehow start dividing Soviet Union in different republics. We should understand that Soviet Union, it's not just Moscow and not just the Russian Federation. It was 15 republics in, in, in uh, Soviet Union and Russian Federation was just one of them. Uh, that's why maybe you heard now the current political news about uh, the UN meeting where our uh, diplomat said that uh, actually uh, not Russian Federation should be a member of uh, UN, 
uh, because uh, the member of U uh, UN, uh, it was Soviet Union. And I think that is the question of continuity uh, that somehow Russia uh, explained everybody that they continued uh, the story of exactly uh, Soviet Union the whole. That's why my attempt today will be to describe the absolutely separate, not absolutely, but autonomous uh, world of uh, Ukrainian leftist architectural ideas. And uh, to explain that that is not something uh, like, I don't know, some Moscow guys came to our empty space and built something. Uh, and even I remember uh, some people said that uh, Ukraine for decades, for, for centuries, was just some land for, uh, for implementing uh, experimental ideas of uh, Russian avant-garde. That is actually not true. And today I will try to explain you why it's not true and why that is quite a, a dangerous construct that somehow connected not with the leftist ideas, but much more with imperialistic ideas. So absolutely opposite situation. So uh, what we can say about Kharkiv? Kharkiv actually, that is really my native, my hometown, my heart, and everything that I have. Uh, for, it, it happens actually all my research started from Kharkiv because uh, the topic of my PhD was exactly Kharkiv tractor settlement, Kharkiv, um, uh, the settlement that called uh, New Kharkiv, near Kharkiv tractor factory. Uh, from that period, uh, it uh, led to the understanding of the whole uh, picture of Ukrainian, so Soviet Ukrainian heritage uh, from the beginning, like 1917, uh, till 1991, and uh, it finished exactly with the book uh, on Slavutich, the last Soviet. Uh, uh, city actually. So, uh, but Kharkiv. Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Ukraine, first capital of Soviet Ukraine. Uh, that was a quite modern city even before. So, all that construct about empty space, uh, I think it's again something very colonial, just to think that uh, nothing w uh, was built before. Uh, so, uh, another point was that uh, we should understand somehow economical and political situation. That when we think about Soviet Union, we think all the time about common administrative system. But we should understand that in the 20s, in the 30s, uh, it was a new economical politics that have a bit, but not actually a bit, different structure and different logic. And when we look at the interwar heritage, Soviet heritage in general, and Ukrainian heritage, we should understand that that is actually the consequences of new economical politics, but not actually of common administrative system. Uh, I think that is very crucial uh, point for understanding how architecture actually uh, builds, how architecture v uh, works, and uh, how to understand why some strange things uh, can happen uh, with it in future. So, uh, I can say that in that period of new economical politics, uh, it was not just uh, the period of some economical development of uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, but moreover, it was the period of so-called uh, so uh, executed renaissance. So it's uh, a quite interesting, more uh, literature uh, phenomenon uh, of uh, flourishing of our culture with a lot of beautiful poets, uh, writers, authors. Uh, moreover, it was a huge uh, rise of different and very interesting movements in artistic sphere, uh, Ukrainian avant-garde, and moreover, it was really a huge development of architectural uh, ideas, architectural sphere. But what sh should I say? That it's not something that developed just again in empty space. If we talk about architecture, because I can talk first of all about architecture, I can say that uh, usually, Architectural development, especially architectural theory development, connected with architectural education. And uh, when we look uh, to Kharkiv, we can see that in the end of the 19th century, in uh, Kharkiv Polytechnic, in those times it was Technical uh, Institute, uh, architectural uh, department uh, was open. And from that moment, uh, exactly 
quite separate, quite autonomous architectural Kharkiv architectural school start to develop. Uh, that's why we should understand that it happened not in Soviet times, like uh, some uh, historical propaganda, uh, propaganda books uh, uh, wrote, but even in before, uh, before uh, revolution times. Moreover, when uh, separate architect local architectural school start growing and developing, uh, that leads to another consequences, for example, such phenomena of Ukrainian national modern. It's like pre-modernist style. It's not, def uh, it's not uh, the same with Art Nouveau or uh, Eugen Stier or something like that. It's much closer exactly to modernism. Uh, and uh, moreover, it had, of course, national features. All this is somehow connected with uh, the revolution of 1905. So not everything started just from the scratch in 1917. That, that was a background of, of a lot of things. And moreover, if we talk about leftist urbanism, what my surprise was when I opened the book of uh, architect, uh, my, uh, architect Maisy uh, Dikansky, and uh, Alexander Ginsburg. They were Kharkiv architects they, that start uh, writing books uh, on urbanism, on um, new issues of new architecture uh, in 1906, 1911, so before the First World War. And uh, when I read the book of Dikansky, I understood that it looked like uh, methodological uh, guidelines for the whole idea, for the whole uh, concept of socialist architecture and socialist urbanism. Like each statement, each methodological base is already developed. Uh, it was developed before the uh, before revolution uh, appeared. So I think that is some uh, background on, uh, on all the topics. But uh, let's return to architecture. And if we return to architecture, we should return to typologies. So of course, first of all, when we talk about leftist urbanism or leftist architecture, I mean so socialistic architecture, actually, or social-oriented architecture. It was not it should be like a guard somewhere, uh, build that buildings. Actually, people build that buildings by their own uh, finances. Uh, and the uh, cooperative movement stopped exactly when Stalin decided to switch uh, economical s system from a new economical politics to a uh, common administrative uh, system. It started that that uh, clothing of the project of cooperative movement uh, started the remains like uh, the house for uh, military uh, workers uh, in Kharkiv on Sumskaya Street. It was built exactly as a cooperative house. Uh, that was actually uh, one of the very interesting streets. Uh, it was built under the project of uh, Jewish architect Steinberg. Uh, here is again another scratch of uh, Steinberg, who was quite an interesting uh, theorist exactly of leftist architecture, and it was his own name. He called himself as a Marxist architect and tried to explain his ideas and how he uh, interpreted uh, Marxist theories through architecture, even in text. Uh, that was quite a, a good in, uh, and interesting. Uh, that's why uh, they just like urban planners that, uh, that have just very old, uh, not current situation map. That's why they heated a lot of buildings uh, for military issues. If the buildings are now the shops uh, or even some glamour shops for Max Mara and so on. But uh, in the Soviet times, that building was uh, for military workers. Uh, and uh, when we talk again about typologies, we talked uh, about uh, residential buildings and uh, cooperative movement. Uh, here is uh, the building uh, of another function, and uh, I can say that uh, I can call that like social infrastructure, but it's not just social infrastructure, it's social cultural infrastructure. And exactly in uh, Kharkiv, we had uh, great and uh, numerous uh, or with, with a lot of uh, objects uh, network of exactly clubs. Usually they were working class clubs, sometimes they were some uh, social groups uh, clubs or some, uh, some organization clubs and so on.
Such clubs, they can be such a point of uh, interest for community and can be a community hubs or, or something like that. But first, the history of such clubs, of course, started from the factories, from the uh, working class culture. And that is the part of working class culture, actually. Uh, and the uh, uh, first working class uh, club uh, was built before revolution in Kharkiv, and it called uh, Club Metalist uh, for the workers of uh, railway uh, factory. Uh, and um, uh, here is the club... Um, Not comfortable. Okay, okay. I want to be closer. Uh, so uh, that is a club of culture of railway workers, and maybe some people who know the history of revolution know that uh, railway workers. It was one of the uh, all the narrative of revolution was. Uh, another point of building uh, built under the project of. Uh, uh, and it was in quite a good uh, condition before this war started. So with a lot of authentic details, uh, stairs, uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, windows uh, and all this. And I can say that uh, the situation with heritage protection actually in Ukraine wasn't good even before war. So we have some troubles in our legislation base. Uh, we had some problems with preservation issues and with uh, conservative uh, work. Uh, that's why the, that example was actually some, um, some, something like a treasure because uh, it was in quite authentic uh, condition. But unfortunately, two days ago, it was under the heat. And uh, you can see here that uh, it was uh, destroyed from this point, but uh, it looks more or less okay from that side, but the heat was from the courtyard. That's why it was uh, heavily, heavily uh, demolished from that courtyard. And uh, moreover, you can see that here we lost uh, windows, we lost all the de details of the first floor. Moreover, in such situation, what is very uh, very dangerous when the house or such a monument can be burned. That is even a uh, more difficult situation, how to, uh, wh what to do then. And of course, my, my first love, uh, that is a Kharkiv tractor factory, a settlement that called uh, socialist city, New Kharkiv. Uh, when I talk about that social oriented uh, functions like cooperative houses and club of cultures, it's more or less similar, I think, with European tradition of such a so socialist architecture uh, that can include, for example, hospitals, uh, kindergarten, schools, uh, for example, some, some other network of, of uh, social oriented typologies. But, uh, that was another example of quite radical architecture, much more radical leftist architecture. And I think that uh, how I understand my native uh, place uh, where actually I lived uh, f in fourth generation, uh, so I'm a local from that district, uh, that, uh, that is exactly the most radical ideas. And uh, how, how the idea worked actually. It was the team of young architects uh, with the leader of the team, uh, architect from before revolution times, academician uh, Pavlo Alyoshin. And the idea was to try again to interpret the Marxist theories and uh, uh, in urban space, exactly not in one object, not in one building, but exactly in urban space. It was a huge, uh, uh, Quite, quite a big town, uh, city, city satellite uh, near Kharkiv, near that Kharkiv tractor factory that was built uh, with uh, ideas and with the help of American uh, architects uh, and American engineers. But exactly that settlement was built just by the ideas of Ukrainian architects, uh, actually from Kyiv. Uh, so they decided to uh, use open quarter and that was uh, actually a discussion that, that is uh, in books, uh, the discussion between old architects and young architects, because old uh, architects, they said that uh, the best uh, form of quarter of block should be closed block. But 
young architects, they stress that uh, the quarter should be open because that is actually the idea of uh, new architecture. And we can see that uh, Ernst May idea of uh, Strokenbau, yeah, uh, or uh, we, we call that Strochne as a Stroika, it means like some stripes, striped uh, uh, development. Uh, and uh, it should be 36 uh, such quarters in, in that settlement, so quite a big uh, population of people. Uh, another idea was that each quarter should consist from different uh, functions uh, that allow people to live happily, but the main idea equally. So equality was like a strong idea uh, like a core idea of all that project. So how they, that young students uh, try to explain how to, uh, how to, s how to uh, gain actually an equal, uh, equality. So for example, they decided that if they use the method of Ernst May, uh, we will have e equal space for each people, uh, for each person. Another point, we will have equal greenery for each person, we will have equal uh, sun, uh, sunshine for each person. Uh, moreover, uh, that allowed uh, wind uh, just just uh, going through the buildings and that is the sanitarium hygienic ideas of healthy society. Another point was exactly marked as a, uh, as a separate uh, order uh, for the architects. Uh, it was the how to uh, gain emancipation, uh, actually emancipation of women. So they decided just to delete uh, kitchens. Uh, so it's quite an interesting idea. So if you have actually a problem with kitchen connected with uh, women, it's simpler just to delete that uh, kitchen at all. So all that buildings, they have no kitchens. Uh, and uh, how people should uh, actually eat and find food. Uh, in that complex, it should be a so-called kitchen factory. We call that, it's literally translation, but it's like semi-finished products, um, cafe or uh, canteen, something like that. So it, it looked like here people will have the food uh, and moreover all that buildings should be connected on the level of the second floor with uh, such a bridge. So bridge, it's really some very uh, important idea of uh, Kharkiv architecture because it's uh, not just here, it's in a lot of other projects. Uh, and um, another point was that on the rooftop of the buildings should be gardens, uh, but it's quite the same for the whole world in that period. Uh, and uh, uh, another point uh, was that kindergartens. You can see here, four kindergartens, they are connected on the level of second floor too. Uh, it allowed uh, women go to work actually, so they can live here, go uh, here and uh, leave uh, their child uh, in kindergarten, then go here and eat and then go to the factory. So they have uh, had even the schedule, what is the ideal schedule of uh, a day of uh, the worker of Kharkiv uh, tractor factory. That, that was quite an interesting uh, evidence again of such a type of ras ras uh, rationalization of the life. So uh, some I can say that some ideas of that uh, of that uh, try and attempt to equality they failed, but uh, that was uh, for many years I think the uh, idea that that ideas f failed just because the ideas uh, actually were bad. But I don't think think that ideas uh, were bad, but implementation maybe sometimes not good. Uh, moreover, the project uh, was changed on the period of construction. And again, we can match that uh, date, quite important date of 1932. Uh, that date is connected not just with uh, uh, architectural issues, not with political issues or economical issues, but moreover with uh, some um, uh, development of so-called style of socialist realism. Uh, so in 1932, uh, like the one uh, main style in the whole Soviet Union should be socialist realism. Uh, that uh, idea to implement one style 
finished with uh, huge uh, campaigns against uh, constructivists, uh, modernists, uh, functionalists, and all other people who are not socialist realism uh, architects. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, such uh, ideas uh, that I described here, they were called exactly leftist ideas, Levatsky idea, who understand Russian. And that is quite funny because actually Stalin said that he is leftist and Soviet Union is leftist state, but why leftist project is bad? But I think that is actually an answer, that uh, real leftist ideas maybe is not okay for them. Uh, and uh, so they decided to, on, uh, to demolish that bridges uh, moreover, they decided to build uh, such uh, such roof. I don't remember how to translate that. Uh, so flat roofs, called uh, as uh, not economical, are uh, not good. Uh, moreover, uh, they they uh, called uh, all that architects uh, that they were crazy young architects who were under the uh, crazy ideas of Ernst May. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, Soviet architects should find their solution and their answers not to copy ideas of uh, Western architects. Uh, here you can see actually what was built, so a bridge should be here. That is the pictures and photos from very good uh, Ukrainian archive of Pshenichny. Uh, and uh, here you can see exactly that canteen. And uh, now it looks like that, because really it's it's not the the it it wasn't the paradise uh, even before war, because it was exactly proletarian district and the factories stopped working as I remember in 2009 or something like that. Uh, that's why it's quite uh, quite a difficult place uh, with uh, different problems, social problems. Uh, but uh, here you can see exactly what happened during the war. Uh, and uh, that idea is actually uh, were not maybe the craziest uh, one uh, because, for example, some uh, uh, again some um, members of the team of Socialist City New Kharkiv they produced another experimental ideas, uh, especially exactly female architect Manucharova. I, I will um, so because that is connected with Manucharova, Nina Manucharova. Uh, she planned a quite interesting uh, and designed quite interesting project of uh, children commune named uh, FED, uh, Felix Edmundovich Dzerzhinsky, FED. Uh, that was a quite controversial idea of Makarenka. Uh, pedagogist Makarenka, uh, that children uh, from uh, abandoned children, uh, Klashar, from uh, without parents, uh, they can be somehow um, educated through work. But from other side, actually, they built factory, and it was uh, the story much more about uh, child labor. Uh, but uh, from the point of uh, heritage protection issues, I think that examples are quite interesting. So, and now um, we are going um, to the maybe the most important point uh, where we actually uh, met with uh, Michaela. Uh, that is the uh, Freedom Square. Uh, can't. Uh, so uh, that is Freedom Square, and uh, I'm definitely sure that through that week uh, you saw a lot of pictures from Freedom Square. Uh, that is the place where the most uh, famous building of modernism in Ukraine, I think, but definitely in Kharkiv, situated. It, it is a building of Dershprom, or maybe some people uh, know better in Russian language Gazprom, but it's not actually Gazprom, it's Gosprom, because Gosprom, it means uh, abbreviation of государственная промышленность. Uh, state industriality. So it's nothing common with uh, Gazprom. Uh, anyway, but it's better to call that Dershprom in Ukrainian language. So uh, that building situated here, that is the masterpiece of constructivism uh, from made from uh, monolite uh, concrete and uh, the first skyscraper in Soviet Union. Uh, 
but in bigger scale uh, from my urban planning uh, background i can mention that here is that freedom square and that the function of the, the freedom square was actually parliament center so it should be the center of governance of the whole ukraine uh, soviet ukraine uh, but uh, here is the old center and it's quite interesting uh, idea of, of uh, not to build, uh, to demolish old center and to build something new, but uh, to make such a dialogue in the space between old and new. So they preserved old center as it was and built new center in the distance. And such a new city and old city, all the time we were somehow in the dialogue between each other, like some old life and new life. And the way from old life to new life uh, connected through the main street of Kharkiv, Sumskaya. So uh, that was actually the idea of architect Steinberg that I uh, men mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, uh, that uh, according to historical materialism, uh, we shouldn't demolish the old buildings even if they uh, were the part of bourgeois heritage. Uh, so we should somehow combine bourgeois heritage with new parts of modernist heritage or with communist or socialist heritage and to show some new discussion between that historical layers. Uh, and uh, moreover, you can see uh, by why I use exactly that picture, because I think that that structure is very beautiful and uh, it can show how that modernist big structure, uh, urban structure, uh, exactly appeared in the old network of old streets. I think it's quite a conceptual idea. Uh, here is uh, again uh, that Freedom Square. So as a main object of Freedom Square uh, was exactly uh, the Sprom building. And uh, uh, the, you can see that bridges, I, I mentioned that bridges, it's very important for uh, Ukrainian uh, architecture of the 20s and the 30s. And uh, from my point of view, that symbolize exactly the horizontal connection, because if you look at uh, Stalinist uh, socialist realism, Seven Sisters in Moscow, you can see that vertical, and that is actually the main idea of vert vertical uh, construction of power. But here you can see the other type of power. So they try to interpret it exactly a power phenomenon and how new power should be implemented and formed exactly in architectural forms with architectural language or through architectural language. And uh, here you can see a uh, so-called uh, square and uh, in the period when it was constructed it was sometimes even permanent constructions with a logo or motto uh, where it was written to manage in new way. So it's quite interesting that they combined exactly such a statements or such a, even promo messages about their power and how they will power or manage in new way through architecture too. So what is actually the universe of that new power of Ukrainian state and I think of Ukrainian national communism period. Uh, you can see the main object uh, that is uh, that Dershprom building, but what is important about that building is uh, again the connection with new economical politics because that building should be the office for uh, uh, different separate and autonomous uh, uh, trusts, syndicates and uh, and other formations uh, of industriality. It means that separate factory actually had opportunity even to sign contracts with uh, foreign uh, specialists, but not just with foreign specialists, but even with uh, foreign customers and foreign partners. So it's quite a big uh, gap of freedom and uh, of doing what they want to do. Uh, so that should be exactly the one building with offices of all that uh, trusts and syndicates. And it was even the first, first time it was even called like house of trusts, uh, Budinok Trastev. So uh, I think that a bit American or capitalist uh, uh, lexic, it's quite interesting uh, tool exactly to un uh, in, in our attempts to understand what was actually the period of the 20s. Uh, so other buildings that should be uh, here, 
uh, uh, now uh, that is the building of uh, Kharkiv State University, but uh, on uh, those time previously during the uh, designing the square, it should be the House of Parliament. Uh, so, but uh, in 1930, they already understood maybe that uh, the capital will be in future uh, moved to Kiev, because we are we were capital just for uh, not uh, from 1917 till 1934. So I'm not very good in mathematics, but uh, some period, interval period. Uh, and uh, then they decided to uh, switch the function to house of projects. I think from some semiotic uh, side of the question, it's quite interesting metaphoric uh, uh, statement too, because uh, on which we based exactly that new type of power uh, on industriality, on architectural projects actually. And from this side, it should be the building of cooperation. But what is actually a cooperation? And it's again some interesting that uh, when our architectural historians uh, talk about uh, new economical politics functions, I think we have the lack of understanding of that uh, economical system and from which uh, functions actually it consists. Uh, that's why usually people just said house of cooperation, who with whom should cooperate in that building? Nothing understandable, just the, the title. But actually, it was a part, again, of uh, new economical politics with the uh, thought that uh, here should be industriality, like one of the biggest uh, ba basic uh, um, columns of ec economy, economy. But cooperation, it means exactly agricultural cooperation. So we can see that freedom, uh, friendship between uh, uh, people from villages uh, who should be uh, somehow connected with agriculture sphere and with proletariat in the cities. So that is actually the universe of that new power. And from uh, other side, uh, so that is the beautiful pictures of that period. I will tell you about other side in a few minutes. So that is the picture how that house of projects looked like uh, after the Second World War. So it was uh, on the shelling again. Uh, it looked like this, but you can see actually the structure uh, of, of the building. And it's quite impressive, uh, even being uh, total, not totally partially demolished. Uh, it's again the pictures after the Second World War. And now, uh, my uh, best friend, socialist realism. So, after the Second World War, uh, there was a no discussion, actually. No discussion. How uh, cities should be reconstructed after bombing uh, and after the Second World War. Uh, it was definitely, they, they were definitely sure that it should be reconstructed in the order of socialist realism. So that is actually the project uh, for this building. Uh, it should look like uh, Moscow State uh, University, uh, Lomonosov University. Uh, you can see that uh, spiral and all that uh, details and so on. So I think that Mm, when we talk about uh, Stalinist reconstruction of the cities, we should understand that it's not just something that uh, all the cities were totally deconstructed, that's why they built new buildings. But some people, even some professors from university, they thought that maybe that building uh, was built in the 50s. So it's something like uh, manipulation, historical manipulation in space, because People and ordinary people start thinking that that, that is uh, actually the achievement of the period of Stalinist reconstruction of the city. Uh, but it was not, because you can see that all the structure of the building is the same. They just uh, combine that with the spile and with architectural details. So they put such a coverage of Stalinist details on the whole buildings of uh, the par parliament center. Moreover, it was even in the newspapers and the architectural magazines uh, very strict uh, critics of uh, modernist uh, idea of that double center system of Kharkiv because they said that uh, it was unreasonable to build new center in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is such a small city, why they should build uh, that second center? But actually they again 
didn't mention that Kharkiv was the capital of Soviet Ukraine. That's why they built new center. Uh, and uh, another problem was uh, that uh, architecture changed. Uh, but um, implementation of the project, of that project with the spiral, uh, exactly appeared in the period of Khrushchev Zhou. Uh, that's why it was not trendy anymore to put all that Stalinist details and that decorations, even it called actually in the Ukrainian or Russian language like Stalinist decoration. It's really like decoration. It's just decorates the building and the initial structure of the building. And that's why they decided to change the project and uh, made something in between. It's not Stalinist anymore, but it's not modernist uh, like it was before. Uh, and such a type of architecture that uh, was built, for example, in 1955 uh, till 1956, 58, it's called even Abdirna architecture, uh, that we can uh, translate like scratched architecture. So we had all that layer of Stalinist details, uh, but then it was scratched. So um, scratched architecture. Uh, the same uh, situation was with, uh, with other side of the, the square. So I uh, shown you the three buildings of the central part. That is the Hotel uh, Internacional, or now that is the Hotel Kharkiv. So you can see how it looked uh, before the Second World War. It was again in the same condition as House of Projects. Uh, it's still okay. And then, uh, actually, the author of the building, uh, uh, he uh, should actually, he had no uh, other choice to change his uh, project uh, to socialist realism. That's why he put that cornice, uh, huge uh, balcon uh, balconies and other details on his project. Moreover, what is a quite funny detail of socialist uh, realism reconstruction is that they always uh, put uh, some column portico uh, on the on facade. It means if you have some constructivist or modernist building, you should just put that Stalinist uh, portico and it will be uh, Stalinist realism at the same time. So, and uh, another very important building uh, that is quite famous in last days, uh, not days, weeks, I think. That is actually the project of architect Steinberg uh, that I mentioned maybe for three times today. Uh, that is his idea how actually that uh, Marxist uh, ideas or his ideas of uh, historical materialism should look like in one object. So he decided that uh, he, should, uh, he should actually reconstruct the building of uh, old administration of the city, regional administration of, of the city, but in Russian language or Ukrainian it's called Zemstvo. So uh, it's like regional council. Uh, he should reconstruct that to the building of Central Committee of Communist Party, Tsakava KPBU of Ukraine, of course. Uh, and his idea was to preserve old building, uh, even eclectic building, and it was um, it's called eclectic, but it's some negative connotation in the word eclectic. So it's some historicism building. Uh, but uh, why historicism building uh, was uh, deeply criticized by uh, Marxist cl critics, um, uh, architectural critics in those times, because it was connected exactly with bourgeois. And they even called that bourgeois heritage. So he decided to preserve bourgeois heritage and that architecture. and. Uh, translate that in the language of architecture as the basis. So that is actually the basis, something old. And here you can see that very beautiful and simplified architecture, uh, such a uh, transparent architecture that is actually a superstructure. So that is exactly the basis and superstructure. Uh, I think uh, it was quite bold and interesting idea. Moreover, for exactly constructivism or for interwar modernism of Soviet times, for all other republics, it's very experimental because it looks like a bit even postmodernist architecture and quite fresh, I think. So for 1927, I think it's uh, quite an, an, an interesting interpretation. Moreover, he really theoretized uh, all that principle and uh, that is uh, very important. So un unfortunately in 1932 the process of denying of such uh, uh, controversial idea 
uh, started and the uh, Central Committee of Communist Party decided to change that structure of basically. So they want monolight. They said that it's um, it's not good when the building is uh, such a controversial with such a contrast. Uh, that is better to uh, standardize all the building in the one way. So they changed th this. And during the Second World War, uh, building uh, was under shelling again and uh, it was burned and then Stalinist uh, socialist realism again appeared. So uh, you can see exactly here how the ideas Central Committee of Communist Party should exactly speak with us uh, what is the ideas. And we can see the starting point of uh, the development of the ideas from that idea of historical materialism and uh, implementation actually of that idea to such a more a bit fascist style building with uh, with uh, the one style, and then after the Second World War, uh, socialist realism with a lot of that uh, huge clones, clones. Uh, Usually, uh, when it was before uh, current war, uh, I said that uh, just imagine that building now is the regional administration of Kharkiv, but it's still central committee corridors, and uh, that is still uh, somehow the same rooms that the uh, central committee of communist party uh, owned. Uh, and it was some my critical point, uh, what, what actually changed uh, if the building is the same. Uh, but uh, when war uh, started, uh, maybe you saw that beautiful photo in New York Times, in Washington Post, and in a lot of other newspapers all over the world. It was made by my friend and uh, uh, photographer of exactly that book that I gave to my publisher in December. Uh, he made a lot of photos exactly of uh, the Kharkiv, of Kharkiv before war, before destruction, before demolition, and now he is uh, on volunteer uh, ideas, uh, he decided uh, to stay in Kharkiv and uh, under shelling he made all that photos. His name is Pavlo Dragoy uh, and uh, I think he is a hero because uh, he is uh, our eyes uh, in all, all, all that architectural world of demolition actually. Uh, moreover, he is very bold because uh, just just when something exploded, uh, pa Pavel Pavlo is already there and made photos. Moreover, when we talk with different uh, preservators, uh, international preservators, they usually say that the one thing that we can do actually is that is documentation. So Pavlo is doing exactly documentation now, documentation of demolition, and uh, but with some artistic and with some uh, emotional uh, side of that process. So here is the photos from inside a space. Uh, it's not already Pavlo. You can see here the names in each uh, photos. I put the names of photographers. Uh, because a lot of photographers and reporters, they actually stayed in uh, Kharkiv, and I think, again, that is the part of uh, resistance of Kharkiv people that they decided to stay. Uh, moreover, I have a friend who is actually a conservator who decided to stay in Kharkiv and preserve what she can. Her name uh, is uh, Katya Kubliska, and she is all the time in communication with city authorities, with regional authorities about how we should protect all the buildings of Kharkiv, and she even uh, gathers some uh, parts uh, of buildings uh, in some uh, warehouse uh, to, to preserve that. And another picture that I uh, think uh, that is a great picture exactly for the end of my lecture because you can see exactly that place uh, from a central committee of communist party and that window. Uh, actually, it's still an realism architecture, but from the window, broken window, you can see modernist uh, architecture of uh, uh, Der Sprom. Uh, I think that after all that background and after all that information, uh, I can uh, share some experience how usually I talk uh, about the role of socialist realism. I usually said that uh, socialist realism uh, had the aim uh, exactly, for example, in Kharkiv uh, after the Second World War uh, to 
Mm, exactly to change some historical narrative, to switch the narrative that everything was built after the Second World War, uh, and to, to cover, to put some layer exactly on the heritage of interwar period and the heritage of national communism. Not to remember the period of uh, Ukrainian capital, not to remember the tragedies that happened there, for example, because Kharkiv one was one of the uh, biggest cities with uh, the victims of Galadon. Uh, moreover, in 1934, even all the capital was like abandoned capital and moved to Kyiv, to more traditional, more religious uh, center of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and I think another point, uh, it was exactly appropriation uh, point. And I think we should somehow mention that appropriation phenomena in that context. But if we talk about Stalinist socialist realism, it looks like physical appropriation. They just wanted to take that uh, achievement or to take that building, to take that physical form of the building and just to cover that like during, you know, that Egypt uh, pharaohs, uh, each new pharaohs, they change tried to change the information about previous one but they preserved actually the uh, the billion uh, the, the structure of the billion uh, but what is something different about this new neo-stalinism uh, I think of uh, Russia or that neo-imperialism of Russia is that they don't want to preserve and change narrative or switch narrative, they want to demolish that totally. So there is another type of appropriation and I think that is no more appropriation of physical objects but much more about ideas. And that's why I think that in the case if all our leftist heritage in Kharkiv and all the Kharkiv will be demolished totally, it gives uh, an opportunity to change the historical narrative about what is, who was actually leftist architects and who actually appropriate and who actually take, preserve that narrative about leftist heritage and leftist architecture and moreover leftist ideas. That's why I think that uh, the aim that should be somehow connected with uh, leftist architects, Ukrainian uh, leftist activists should be to preserve that narrative, uh, to claim that narrative as our narrative and to think about that from our history, not to allow uh, to appropriate that narrative. Because for many years uh, I should uh, somehow fight with a lot of people to describe that that is Soviet, not just Soviet, that is Soviet Ukrainian modernism, moreover that is Ukrainian modernism, that is Ukrainian constructivism. For years I should argue that um, that, uh, that, that that is ex exactly existence of Ukrainian culture, existence of Ukrainian leftist culture, and not everything Soviet is just Moscow. And um, I think that if people say that architecture is not something political, I will just laugh. <laughs> because it's, it's the most political type of art or type of activity. Uh, but if now people say that uh, architectural heritage or heritage protection or heritage issues is not something political, I would argue and my arguments will be that pictures. Thank you. For for this, should I stay or should I go? Maybe we should stay because maybe there will be some questions of our audience. Um, I would like to just um, to really thank you for this historical overview of leftist um, architecture in in Kharkiv. I think um, we saw, and it was really interesting again because some of the the architecture heritage I saw in reality. And um, you see how architecture can shape the everyday life and also how architecture can be also instrumentalized by power structures, by political structures. And the question is, um, 
how to protect this heritage. This is, was the question you asked uh, at the beginning. And also how to reconstruct it. Because uh, uh, this heritage, this architecture we saw, went through um, different phases, also phases of uh, deconstruction or... Um, reconstruction. Yeah, and also reconstruction. And I think that's the question we will face for the future, how to reconstruct, how to deal with this heritage, how to preserve it. And um, yeah, thank you very much for this um, uh, interesting um, talk and your ideas you shared with us. Um, now it, you have the possibility to ask questions if somebody would like to um, ask something. So maybe now is the time to ask questions. I will also check the, um, the YouTube chat so if somebody would like of our um, digital um, guests can also ask questions in our uh, chat right now. So Inge will go through with the uh, microphone and if somebody would like to add something, if somebody would like to ask something, um, please uh, feel free to make your questions now. Uh, you were talking about the tradition of, of clubs, of clubs in, in Kharkiv. And I'm interested if this tradition is still alive and if there are still clubs that are, that are used and if that's the case, um, which function do they, do they have nowadays? Uh, that is quite interesting that that function preserved. Uh, and uh, even, even the clubs of some factories that n uh, not existed anymore, for example, like the uh, club of uh, the factory Hems, uh, actually, uh, Hems uh, not, not working anymore. Or a club of uh, Serp Molot, uh, it's Harm and uh, Weichel, or how to, how to call that? Serp Molot. <laughs> ah, Harm, yeah. So uh, it's not working, but club exists. And club still, still um, uh, works with a lot of uh, different community functions with some uh, s small uh, children opportunities for uh, artistic uh, training, for some mu musical training and so on. Sometimes uh, that uh, uh, objects uh, are given for the rent. Uh, yeah, really, for example, but again for some activities, usually for activities. I don't remember, for example, some shop or something like I don't know, some commercial function. Usually it's something about activities. Uh, moreover, I think uh, that network of uh, working class clubs uh, uh, can give even more opportunities if it will be like community centers. Because uh, usually they, they spread through all the whole uh, city and it, it can provide uh, uh, that functions like uh, community uh, centers. Uh, but another problem is that sometimes uh, that is very um, problematic uh, to understand uh, in which property that object is, because if factory uh, not existing anymore, who is actually the owner of the building? Sometimes that is the city council property, uh, that's why it still works, for example. Uh, with that social uh, or cultural function. Sometimes that is private owner, but usually what is interesting, for example, with that club of culture of Hems that I mentioned, that even private uh, owner, I don't know why, but still preserved all that activities. I don't know why. Of course, it's, it's really in very bad conditions, but it's still working, so it's working. That, that is not like abandoned buildings or something like that. And that building of uh, railway workers, I think it's uh, quite successful and quite good and they even had some uh, conservation projects uh, because they restored uh, the appearance of the building and some movies uh, uh, were shot in that building. That's why they really uh, thought about uh, restoration of the building and preserving that and they estimated the quality and uh, function of the building. Yes, thank you for your uh, fine uh, lecture. Uh, when 
Um, I also think that heritage is very, very political and to concern with heritage. Um, uh, when I saw your lecture, I'm thinking uh, from a Western point uh, in direction Berlin, uh, where they are also handling heritage in a special way. And uh, when we think uh, that the Russian troops have to leave Ukraine, uh, what will then be uh, to, uh, to handle heritage? Uh, is, is there also, do you see that there is also a use to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to make a, um, um, a river between Russia and Ukraine in form of heritage to choose special heritage of certain, uh, certain uh, periods uh, or uh, will there be uh, uh, of uh, Ukrainians that will um, uh, ask for their history and what they are remembering that there was? And uh, what what are you concerned about that? I definitely sure uh, in, in response of your question that uh, the future is in some new type of critical heritage studies. So that is the question of some critical type of thinking, and I'm definitely sure that Ukrainian society is ready to be critical and not to choose one style, because it's quite funny and it looks like socialist realism approach, because exactly in those times it was chosen some styles that are allowed to be uh, somehow implemented in that socialist realism. For example, some uh, ethnical architecture, or sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, that can be some features of Baroque architecture. So yeah, definitely, heritage uh, is uh, deeply politicized. Uh, that's why I think that it, it, it will be uh, really our mistake if we uh, said that that is bad uh, style, that is good style, and the same actually like uh, the discussion about bourgeois architecture, the, absolutely the same. That's why I think that uh, that is a great opportunity to think about leftist heritage and how we should preserve that and how should we understand that as our heritage. Uh, to understanding what is uh, even 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 in contradictional uh, periods, even uh, connected with contradictional history, that is the huge world of that uh, leftist architecture with a lot of uh, persons, with a lot of networks, with a lot of lines, with <coughs> quite tragic and beautiful histories. That's why I am definitely sure that we shouldn't deny all that past because actually, if uh, we talk about heritage protection, what what is the reason why, why should we actually protect heritage? Exactly to remember what happened, uh, exactly to preserve memory. Uh, that's why I'm definitely sure that we will find the solution. What is uh, something maybe connected with Mikhail's question? What we should do, I think exactly that Freedom Square can be a case of new approach and of discussion. Uh, if uh, after the Second World War it was no discussion between Stalinist reconstruction of the city, now we definitely should have the discussion. We should have wider discussion about what we should do with uh, such uh, a multi-layer heritage uh, object because it's really, it's not just like like a Rembrandt picture where c we, we can uh, talk about this because it's so political. Uh, and if we can see, for example, that house of projects that I've shown with a lot of layers, uh, I don't know what to do. For example, I remember during an interview with Jean-Louis Cohen, I asked him about that house of project, what his opinion is on this. And he said that, he said that it's better to decolonize that object, and it was like a joke, decolonize, to take off columns. And uh, to open up uh, the initial structure, initial appearance and, uh, and concept of that modernist architecture. So, Actually, I have no answer because no discussions. I'm not a Stalinist architect uh, to say how we all should do and what we should do with uh, this heritage. Uh, first, I think that that is common heritage. Moreover, Dershprom, he is in temporary list of UNESCO World uh, Heritage. That's why I think that is actually our heritage. It's not just Ukrainian heritage. It's our common heritage. That's why I'm really waiting and uh, I believe that we will have that beautiful discussion, discussion that maybe uh, will change 
us or or society. <laughs> I, I also have a question about the, uh, the so-called decommunization law, right? It's, um, uh, which was, um, I think, realized uh, after 2014 or something, 15, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but um, this was the question or the, it was the law to um, how to deal with the Soviet heritage. And, and how do you see this approach? Because when you talk about all heritage, we should be aware of it. And how do you see now this law? Or how did you see it before the war? Uh, first, uh, that law uh, was, wasn't connected with architecture. So usually it's like misunderstanding exactly that that law is connected with modernism or Soviet modernism. It's usually about monumental art. So it's connected, for example, with mosaic, mm -hmm. with some paintings or some murals or something like that, if we talk about art. Uh, that's why I think that uh, moreover it was some description that that is just about not not about the whole picture but just about symbols of uh, Soviet power. Uh, from my side, I think that uh, it should be solved in a bit other way. For example, not to uh, to to put some uh, some paintings on that uh, symbols, for example, but it's better to make some descriptional text that describes uh, what was the history, what was the history of object, and what is the context of uh, all this. I think uh, that can provide exactly some critical approach in space and uh, in understanding of art and place uh, of art actually in all that institutionalization uh, of uh, politics and uh, power structures actually because I think that the communication law somehow ha uh, wanted actually uh, aimed uh, to do this but actually it may be uh, not in a very uh, correct way but it's really nothing connected with architecture so modernism never was uh, in danger because of the communication law it's definitely so i i i heard some speculative talks about this but it's really not not like that it's really just about art mm -hmm. uh, and exactly monumental art not art in museums it's it's uh, art in public space as i remember mm -hmm. uh, so i'm Mm, that one who thinks that it's better to write some uh, some description and uh, it, it it will be better than than to cover to remember it yeah to remember it and to think about it uh, I was quite fascinated about uh, this, this very crucial turning point of the year 1932, which you mentioned, which uh, was obviously quite quite important with the takeover of socialist realism, and and that that uh, the proponents of the new style, let's call the style, called the previous style a leftist, as sort of saying that it's bad. And I was wondering why they did that. If they say. Uh, and what if that was some kind of code? If you say leftist, you say Western. If you say Western, you say international. International is cosmopolitan, and that's a code word for, for Jewish. Or if there was some kind of anti-Semitism sort of running around in the background. Definitely. Uh, th th that was even some funny discussions in uh, state magazines, architectural magazines of that period when uh, two objects, uh, one object was uh, in Kyiv, it was uh, uh, now that is a ministry, not a ministry, it, it's now cabinet minister of cabinet of ministers uh, on Grushevsko, as I remember. Uh, that was built by architect Famin. But uh, a bit nearby that building, that is uh, like the same building. Actually, as, as an architect, I can say that it's the same, but with different color. Uh, that was made, uh, it's now actually the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, that was built by the architect um, Langbert. Langbert, we can understand, according to Sony, uh, what, uh, that he was Jewish. And it was absolutely like two articles. Uh, one article about Famine was uh, like uh, such a beautiful building. It's really correct building. It's really socialist realism. That is socialist realism. And near that, it was an article about Langbert architecture. And they said that it's really very bad archi uh, architect. That is really a very bad architecture. They even made something like um, 
um, like a meeting with different leaders of opinions, with different uh, film directors. Uh, th they all said that it's awful building. It's from any point of view that building is really awful. Uh, I think that uh, that was um, uh, that were few ways of anti-Semitism in Soviet Union, and to think about Soviet Union as a not anti-Semitic state, I think it's really a huge mistake and a misunderstanding. Uh, for example, uh, I worked with uh, third wave uh, uh, in Brezhnev period uh, because uh, I made the research on exactly Kiev modernism and. Exactly, uh, I took an interview with architect Mikhail Budilovsky and uh, other team uh, members of, uh, of him. Uh, and uh, moreover, that is the uh, uh, memories of Avram Miretsky. Uh, it's usually about 70s, and uh, they described a lot of features of anti Semitism. And Budilovsky immigrated uh, f first in Vienna and then to the USA in Chicago, exactly according to that uh, wave of anti Semitism in architectural circles. Uh, moreover, in the 30s, I, I'm definitely sure that uh, it's connected with this. Uh, and uh, that is exactly this uh, logic as you described. Uh, usually it's exactly like this. Uh, another point is uh, that uh, sometimes uh, they, they used any arguments uh, just to say that that person uh, was wrong. Uh, for example, sometimes at the same time they said that that is nationalist architecture. Even uh, talking about modernism, simplified uh, modernism, they said that that is nationalist. Ukrainian nationalists built that. Or sometimes they said that that was built under Zionism. So Zionist thinks. Uh, so actually, in the 30s, they they have like a chaotic thoughts about what was actually a socialist realism and what is uh, something on the other side of socialist realism. They tried to construct that awful modernism that is connected uh, and that is an evil. But what is the answer to that uh, modernism? I think they, they had a lot of mistakes and misunderstandings and a lot of contradictions. In the 30s, it was like total contradictions in socialist realism theory. It's really funny even to find that contradictions uh, when they, in one text, they said absolutely opposite things. So <laughs> far. Thank you. Um, thanks for being with us today, tonight. Um, thank you, Shenya, for the talk. Thanks for coming to Vienna and also to IG Architektur. Um, also, thank you to Treat and Oliver Schmidt for the technical support and, of course, to Claiming Spaces for the cooperation. So we will have the opportunity to uh, talk also a bit more informal um, in our courtyard. And yeah, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you.